Dress to Kill is a book about the Desengaños Amorosos by Maria de Zayas, which was published in 1647. Maria de Zayas is a Spanish novelist. She wrote a collection of 10 stories and called them the Desengaños Amorosos, which means disillusions in love. It's been difficult for scholars to understand what this book means. And when I read it, I'd been reading it for about 20 years before I started working on it. I started hating Maria de Zayas. I had a real antagonistic relationship with her, and that's a bad sign for a literary critic. It means that something is wrong. So I realized I needed to work harder to understand what the book was about, and all of us needed to work harder to understand what the book was about. It's full of violent images of murdered women. They're decapitated, locked in chimneys for six years until their flesh rots to the bone, poisoned until their bodies swell to horrible proportions. And then after they die, God apparently silently visits their corpse and renders it beautiful, which is a symbol of their having been assimilated into heaven. And this isn't a religious book. I found all this very troubling, mostly because inside the story, inside the book, there are, there's a narrative frame in which female protagonists tell women time and time again that they need to defend themselves, they need to get educated, and they need to not let anyone insult them or harm them. But inside the stories, none of the female protagonists do that. And instead, they concede to this violent death that they suffer. And this made me furious at Maria de Thais. So about five years after I started working on it, I realized that uh, the problem was me, <laughs> and I needed to figure this out. So what I did was take 12 years to move my brain back in time to try to understand what she was saying from her own context, context because it was clearly incomprehensible in hours. And that's what I did. And it was a long haul, and here we are. <laughs> there are several reasons why this is important. For one thing, it reconciles the book with itself. It enables us to understand what the meaning of these violently killed female corpses is in a 17th century Spanish context. And second, it points to Spanish Baroque literature as a potential precursor, actually maybe even the origin, of Gothic aesthetics, which swept uh, over Europe at the beginning of the 18th century, which allows Spain to figure in the European intellectual program in a way that it often, matter of fact, usually doesn't. Um, they say that um, Africa begins at the Pyrenees, and to this day, Spain is systematically excluded from literary culture, even historical studies about Europe. And I th what I'm trying to do in part is um, undo that thinking to show that uh, Maria de Zayas was read outside of Spain shortly after the publications of the Desengaños in 1647 and thereafter. Her works, this collection of novelas and the previous one, were translated into many European languages under the name of Cervantes and they circulated widely, but nobody knew that they were reading Maria de Zayas. And they were also published independently without, in translation without giving credit to her. Spain was an exotic place after the birth of the modern era because Spain took a long time to drag itself out of the imperial power that was decadent into the modern age. And as Europe marched on into the future, Spain lagged behind and it became a very sexy, exotic place for artists to think about. And my suspicion is that the Desengaños form part of that mystery. There's a lot of convents in there. There are a lot of Gothic tropes in the Desengaños that Thais uses in a very different way than Gothic authors did. But I think that they found that incredibly compelling. And at the heart of this aesthetic is the figure of the violently killed, stunningly beautiful woman. Um, so that's, an, that's reason number two why I think this is important. And finally, and perhaps the most important justification for, for the study was to negotiate the position of this book in which the female dead corpse figures so prominently with the tradition of the uh, cult of the dead woman, which figures prominently in Western aesthetics. It's relatively known that, uh, it's relatively well known that Edgar Allan Poe in The Philosophy of Composition in 1846 
wrote, um, The Death of a Beautiful Woman Unquestionably is the most poetic topic in the world, which is a really scary thing for somebody to say. And in Maria de Thayas, that's exactly what we have, are these incredibly beautiful, perfect women who submit, not willingly, but because they can't do anything else, to their own violent deaths. And in the context of Thais's meaning and the intertext that she embedded in the work with Catholic hagiography, the, the women's deaths are sanctioned by God, although God does not want them to die. So it's a, it's a play with transcendence and lack of transcendence. She's, she's stepping on the gap between the pre-modern culture where God is in, in control of everything and is a benevolent force and the modern culture where we're not really sure that God's there at all and the, the role of God is questioned inside the text. And Sias is right astride those two traditions. So she's still invoking a Catholic meaning, uh, a transcendent meaning for the deaths of these women. God accepts them into heaven but she's breaking with the hagiogra hagiographic tradition that says that these women want to die to the glory of God because they don't die to the glory of God. They die because their society mistreats them um, because of its own defective behavior. So if we put Thais in the center of this tradition of the cultural pattern that uses a beautiful dead woman's body to say something that isn't the meaning of the woman herself, which is what we do now. We get a, trans, a, a, a history that runs from Catholic hagiography, where we see, I, I have some images here that will embed, where we see things like a, a female martyr being tortured and her breasts are being cut off and she's beautiful and she's surrounded by men and she's going to die. Or a woman whose head has been cut off and her face is impassive and she's beautiful and her cadaver is beautiful and there's blood flowing out of the neck. In this context, the death of the, good, of the woman is a good thing because she wanted to die. And then we have the desengaños in which women are killed by the corrupt society and God steps in at the very last minute, at the very latest minute possible and says, these were good women and you were wrong and you have lost a wonderful asset, a very important asset. And I'm gonna prove this to you by showing you what you have lost, by making her as beautiful as she can be. So her corpse is stunningly gorgeous. So from there, we move on to the Gothic tradition and then onto later more modern traditions that use the female corpse at, at their core. And we get images such as the one on the cover of the book, which is uh, in 1895, uh, J.W. Waterhouse, beautiful, horribly beautiful, painting of Saint Eulalia splayed out dead after having been crucified, stunningly beautiful. And from there we move on to advertising in the 20th and 21st century that uses the bodies of dead women, violently killed women, to advertise material artifacts for purposes of selling them. And in this context we can look at a shoe ad that presents a corpse of a bleeding woman in a body bag next to this pair of Italian leather shoes, or one that um, has a picture of a stick figure shooting a gun at a female figure on the top of which says bitch, and then underneath it says bitch skateboards. Clearly there's violence against women and death of women embedded in that advertising. And then finally, perhaps most similarly to Sayas, there's a perfume ad here that shows a gorgeous woman dead on a bed as a perfume ad. So somewhere something went wrong and somewhere something veered off from what Thais wanted it to be, but I suspect that she was crucial in bringing the merits and the usefulness of a female corpse into the public eye and into the artistic eye. And that's why Dress to Kill is important. This is a book about dead women, it's not pleasant. Um, I worked on it for 12 years and I think I've become another person since I finished with it. It was very difficult to work with. Um, however, I think it would be of interest to a wide range of people, obviously to Hispanic students and scholars, um, as well as sociologists and historians who are interested in data about early modern European rape, um, marriage laws, 
and domestic violence, all of which I had to look into to find out how historical this fiction is. Also, uh, any historians of religious culture will be interested in it in this in the transfer of religious imagery and meaning into the secular artistic field to see how it changes and what happens to God in the position of the text in that context. And then anyone who's interested in how an author can use the death of a virtuous and beautiful woman to say something positive about women, which I think is Sias's magic. And as far as I know, she's the only author who's really been able to do that. That's a compelling and important story. I think the book would be of interest to anybody who wants to figure out how a woman can do that. And then finally, anybody who wants to read a book that's what we call archive intensive would be interested in this book. Uh, it was very important for me to have access to all of the resources I had access to to accomplish everything that's in this study because I had to go back in time to review things that nobody had ever looked at before, some of which was the data I mentioned about domestic abuse, rape, and violence, and some of which was investigation, a lot of which was investigation into early saints' lives. I read several thousand saints' lives before I found the ones that, that Thias actually used, which were from the late Middle Ages. And there's a reason for that as well, why she used that particular one. But it took a long, long time to figure all of this out, and the resources I had at my disposal were indispensable. The bibliographers at BC were crucial, and the interlibrary loan staff was absolutely central. And I worked with scholars and curators and archivists from all over the world to bring all this to bear on what I think is a really important book that could be very interesting to a lot of people.